Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for every life that is represented in this place tonight. And we know that there is no accident, there's no coincidence that every single woman you have brought into this place is here for a reason. They're here for their life to be changed. And so we welcome your transformation. We welcome your faithfulness. And we know that you are here, Lord, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So I, uh, so ever since I have been here tonight, I've been a little weepy. So I'm sorry for this. They uh, had me in the prayer room being weepy, and then out here, and then worship was incredible. Was that not incredible? I loved it. I'm telling you, everything that North Church does is completed in complete excellence. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. I'm in a lot of different churches, and the word that comes to me, it actually came to me today to describe North Church, is uncommon. There is an uncommon spirit here. It is absolutely perfect everything and I love it I love being here I love your pastors and I don't just say that because I'm obligated because I'm on their stage but I really love them I could not wait I came in on Saturday we had dinner we hung out last night we and so I just love them they're just full of grace and love and it's so nice to be here it's so great to be a part of this her night and like Pastor Shannon said, I, my name is Sheila Harper. I'm the president and founder of an organization called Save One. And what we do at Save One, simply, we help men, women, and families recover after abortion. Because abortion isn't just, it doesn't just affect one person, it affects many around that one choice. And so we help people by by offering Bible studies at churches and pregnancy centers, three different Bible studies that I wrote for each of those genre of people. And we have chapters all over the world. We're in 21 countries right now. And when I first started Save One, I could have never imagined that we would grow to this size. But you don't grow to this size without a need, without fulfilling a true need that's there. And so we travel around all the time, and we get to talk about Save One, and so I get lots of invitations like this, but I want to talk to you tonight not about Save One so much as, and, and you taking up the offering, that, that again, I just burst into tears. We have been raising this money to purchase our headquarters for a year and a half, and we have to have the money by September 15th. And so we have been down to the wire, we've had galas, we've had fundraisers, we've been blanketing social media. I mean, it's just been unreal. And so to think that that is a possibility is, um, is I, I can't, I don't even have words to express to you how happy that makes me. <laughs> but when Pastor Shannon said, oh yeah, and we have a table out there, so I would love to meet with you. I would love to talk to you about Save One if you have questions. If you want to check out our resources, we have t-shirts. We already sold several t-shirts to people, so please wear them with pride. But come and visit at the table, because I would love to meet you. But when Shannon said that she wanted me to talk on being faithful tonight, when she said that that was the theme of this night, my mind just went in all these different directions, because there's so much that encompasses that theme of faithful. You know, when you describe someone as being faithful, it kind of warms you. It's like, oh, they're faithful. To be described as being faithful is huge. I would love to be that to be an adjective. Someone describes me, oh, Sheila, she's faithful. I, I love that. And so when I, I, my mind went in all these different directions, I started thinking, okay, Lord, what is it you want me to say? Because I can think of all these different things I want to say, and he told me, keep it simple and talk about the results of being faithful. And I was like, okay, this is going to be fun. The results of being faithful. What does faithful really look like? You know, when you want something done, you don't call the people that never show up. You call the people who are faithful. 
the people that you know, like, oh, if I have a problem, I can go talk to her or I can go talk to him and get advice or whatever because you see them here all the time. They're always there when they say they're going to be there. They keep their word and they're faithful. And it's like the faithful rise up like they're, and they're like this head and shoulders above everybody else. And it's like the, the faithful is the cream of the crop. If you didn't notice, I'm from the South, so I may use a few things like that. But they rise up to the top above everybody else. And you see them. They're the faithful. They're the ones that you want around them. I put a lot of stock in friendship, in loyalty, in faithfulness. As a pastor's wife, you can imagine sometimes people aren't faithful to you. And it's hurtful. And so those that are faithful to you, you want to hold them close. You want to say, okay, we're going to do this thing together because you're faithful. And so I want to show you an example, a very shallow example of what I'm talking about. But I'm going to put a, a picture in your head, and I want to keep you to keep that in your head tonight, okay? So David, come up here. He doesn't know what I'm going to do. I can do this to David. He's like my son. My surrogate son. Is your mom here tonight? She's there in Seattle. Oh, shoot. I was hoping to get to meet her. But anyway, y'all sent, y'all sent David to Nashville, and he became my surrogate son in Nashville, where I'm from. And so last time I was at North Church, we met, and then, you know, he became my neighbor. So anyway, show us your bicep. <laughs> I, knew if I, I knew if I told you... <laughs> I knew if I told you, you wouldn't want to do it. (laughs) Show us that gun. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. No, no, keep on. Keep on. (laughs) Don't make me do it. (laughs) Look at that. Okay, so are y'all ready? (laughs) Can can you tell our arms apart? Like when when we put up our bicep? Oh, that's, you you felt something in there, right? Who has been faithful to the gym? (laughs) David went to the gym and was faithful when it was raining. You went and you were faithful to the gym probably when you didn't feel very good. And he probably went to the gym when, you know, he, he may have gotten two or three hours of sleep, but you got up and you went. He didn't hit the snooze like I do. And I'm like, oh, girl, just stay in the bed. Those sweatpants look good. (laughs) If I would be faithful to the gym, I could tone my arms. I'm never going to grow a bicep like that because he's a man. But I could tone my arms. But it hasn't been a priority for me. I haven't submitted to the process of being faithful to the gym to tone my arms. But he has. So y'all keep that in your mind tonight, okay? Thank you, David. I love you. You still love me? Yes, I love you. (laughs) I told y'all it was a shallow example. (laughs) You know, I can go for a week to Planet Fitness and work on my arms, and all I'm going to have is pain. I've got to be faithful even through the pain. Because if I keep on and keep on and keep on like David has, he didn't just show up to the gym for a week and work his arms. I'm sure at one point his arms were as scrawny like mine. But actually, I've got that thing going on, you know. It scares me sometimes. And like I'll be waving and not thinking and I'm like, oh, because I feel it. And I'm like, oh, put some sleeves on, girl. It's bad. But I could show up for a week and all I'm going to have is pain. I've got to keep working out through the process, even when it's painful, to get to the results of being faithful, right? And I've got my notes up here because I can go off on a tangent sometimes and this is going to keep me focused because I have a limited amount of time. But it's the same in our spiritual lives. God created us for community. He created us for community. He created us to walk this thing out together, to be faithful to each other. Have you ever thought about the the fact that God is using us 
as his answer on the earth. Think about that for a minute. He, is, is, he chose us to be his hands and feet on the earth, to help his, uh, his daughters and his sons become who they're supposed to be. He's using us, me and you, not just me because I'm on this stage, not just Shannon because she's the pastor's wife. Every single one of us create the body. And so we're supposed to be faithful to the process to be used as God's hands and feet here on this earth. Think about that for a minute. That is an incredible fact. And when we seclude ourselves, we opt out of the process. And then we don't get the results that we want. We don't get those, that, that result of being faithful when we opt out of the process. I'm reading a book right now, the, a book called Lo, uh, wait, Life Without Lack. Has anybody ever read that? It's by Dallas Willard. Really? Nobody? Well, I'm recommending it to everybody. I should get a commission from Dallas Willard. But I'm telling you, I'm, I'm an avid reader, and so I'm usually in a race with myself to see how quick I can get through a book. And I'm usually like at one a week, and I'm like, I'm done. This book is so good. I, I'm about halfway through with it, and I'm only, I've been on it like two weeks. And so it's one of those books that you pour over, and I'm highlighting and reading over and over. So I recommend it to anybody. But here is a quote, and this, I think this sums up exactly what I want to say tonight. But it's a quote from Dallas Willard. It says, There is something about faithfulness and loyalty between people that is precious and beautiful because it is a reflection of what is possible between man and God. See, we are supposed to mimic our relationship with God here on earth with each other. Not just commune with him, but commune this way as well. Because he says, his word says that we sharpen each other when we walk out community together. When I first became a Christian and joined the Christian world, you know how like a lot of times we start talking in that Christianese and, and when you don't know it, you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I would hear people say, iron sharpens iron, you know? And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like, uh, I would picture like two big things of iron just like pounding up against each other. And I'm like, I don't, I don't understand how that would sharpen eventually. Like, I don't get it. But when you look at that whole verse, when you read the whole verse, it makes sense. But people who haven't been a Christian and don't know Bible verses by heart don't know the whole verse. But the whole verse, it's Proverbs 27, 17. And it's a good verse to commit to memory, and it's our anchor verse tonight. But Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And that's exactly what we're talking about. It's so simple. I wanted to really dig into this verse and see what it meant, so I looked up the word sharpen in its original language. Sharpen in its original language is a word called shadad, okay? You don't have to remember all that. But it's a word called shadad. It's only used five times in the whole Bible, the word shadad. The other four times is every single time it's being used in the Bible, it's talking about something killing something. So it, it's like you're sharpening a sword to go to war, or you're sharpening something to slaughter an animal. So I don't think it's any, any um, coincidence or mistake or anything that God used the word shadad in this text. Because when we get together and we walk this out together, we start to kill off those bad habits that have formed. Have you ever been to one of those, and again with exercise, to one of those um, like diet websites or exercise websites or whatever, and you're researching something, and they always encourage you to have an exercise buddy. Why is that? Because even they know that we need community. They know that we need accountability. 
because it's so much easier, like I said before, to just roll over and hit the snooze than it is to call your friend and say, I just, I just don't, I'm just going to stand you up today. <laughs> I've done it, but it's a whole lot harder, <laughs> obviously. But it's a whole lot harder to do because you have that accountability. It's sharpening. When you have that exercise, buddy, they're killing off those lazy habits of not working out. And so when we sharpen each other, we kill off the pride and the, and the seclusion that we tend to get in. What, I, and I know this is true for me, but when something goes wrong in your life, what is your first reaction? A lot of times we pull back, don't we? We pull away from community. Something goes wrong in our marriage and we're embarrassed about it. And we don't want anybody to know. And so we, we move away and we seclude ourselves. And when we do that, where are we? We are in the exact spot that the enemy wants us because we're secluded and we're vulnerable and we're open to attack. So you can't move yourself over here because something went wrong. You may have a secret sin that you don't want anybody to know about. And so you feel like, oh, I can't, I can't really hang out with them because they might find out that I'm whatever. Or you may have some type of financial situation and you may be about to be filing bankruptcy. And so you get embarrassed and you're like, oh, I can't go to the church tonight because they'll want to know this or that. And so you pull away. That can't be, that cannot be our first our first go-to response because God created us for community. And when we have those moments, when we have, and we all have those moments that we're embarrassed about, that things happen in our life and we don't want people to know. And so when we have those moments, we have to lean into our community and, and not wait until you have the problem, then jump in. But go ahead and start cultivating those relationships, entering into that mentor on purpose discipleship process. And then when the storm hits, you already have your foundation around you. And, the, and your friends know, and they can carry you. Galatians 6 1 or 6 2 says, carry your burdens for each other, and you fulfill the law of Christ. We have to be there and know what's going on to be able to carry that burden. Giving of ourselves and receiving. Sometimes it's easy for us to give, but it's hard for us to receive. You have to do both. It's a reciprocal relationship. But nowhere in the Bible does it say, if I sow into you, and I spend all this time on you, you must reciprocate a relationship with me. <laughs> Nowhere does it say that. The law of sowing and reaping has never ended. So when you sow into another person, you are going to reap that harvest. So if you're being a friend over here, and that person doesn't end up being your friend, you're going to reap a friend somewhere. I'm going to tell you guys a story that I haven't told in public at all because it, it was very raw, very real. And it was, uh, it was less than a year ago. But I had probably the most hurtful moment in my ministry, probably 10 months ago. And it was a girl that... When, uh, when my boys were growing up, they grew up with this kid, and, and he was great. We absolutely loved him. He grew up, ended up marrying this girl, uh, entered the military. They moved off for a long time, but then when they moved back here to the States, they were like in their late 20s, early 30s. And when they moved back here to the States, they became our youth pastors. And so it was like a match made in heaven. We already knew this guy. Uh, we loved him. We loved his family. And I already loved her. It was like we just took right up. And into the relationship, I started noticing some red flags, you know, some, some toxic behavior. 
and but we loved them and so we we were just like oh you know they'll grow up they'll mature they'll get over that we can we can pour into them me and my husband both were pouring and pouring and pouring our lives into this couple and we loved them we learned stuff from them they learned from us and it was just a match made in heaven i would travel i would buy her gifts and send her cards and tell her she was the daughter i never had and she called me her spiritual mother and i mean it was just so great and about two years into this relationship she sent me an email that was horrible like just horrible like i would never wish an email like this on any of you guys and I was so shocked by it because I had no idea she felt this way about me. It was this litany of things that I had done wrong to her, that the church was wrong, just everything. Well, I was devastated because I had no idea. Well, fast forward, we had to sit down and have one of those meetings and it's awkward and they cried and they apologized and we hugged and we loved each other again. Well, about six months later, I got another one of those emails. And I was like, what the heck is going on? But I loved her. I kept thinking, you know what? It's going to be okay. We're going to get over this. We're going to walk this out. We're going to keep on. We're going to keep on. And I started noticing every relationship around them had conflict. There was constant conflict. There was conflict with them and other staff members. There was conflict with them and people in our church. And it just became like this ah, oh, like this, this constant thing, but we kept loving them. And then they would apologize and everything would be good. And so it was just this topsy-turvy thing until one day they walked in, said, we need to talk to y'all after church. And I was like, oh no, because I could tell something was wrong. After church, Jack and my husband and I could hardly even concentrate on church because we knew something was coming. As soon as church was over, they had been at our church maybe five years or so. And as soon as church was over, they just said, we're done. We're, we don't want to be here. We don't want to be with y'all. We, I mean, it, it was just like they just washed their hands of us. And we loved that couple. I mean, loved that couple. And I wish I could tell you through my tears, through my river of tears that I cried that whole week, I wish I could tell you that I stood strong and I, you know, just jumped right back in there. But for days, I told my husband, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not ever going to enter into a relationship like that. I'm not ever going to get close like that to somebody on staff. I'm not ever doing that. Don't ever ask me to do that. <laughs> I was telling him that. And at that point, he was like, yes, dear, yes, okay, we won't, no. You know, just to make me happy, just so I'll stop crying. And so as we went through this process, I started seeing that our worship leader, Kara, and David knows Kara. Where did David go? He, he, she, she was devastated as well she and this girl were the best of friends and when i saw the hurt and pain in her eyes because she this girl just walked out washed her hands of all of us and so she had lost this friendship and i was watching her and i knew i need i i'm the older woman i need to help her through this but yet i am devastated as well how do i help her through this and so all I knew to do was just to lean into her. I leaned into her friendship. She leaned into me. And 10 months later, both of us, because we were so open and honest about what we were dealing with, how we were dealing with this, we would call each other and say, oh, I listened to this great sermon. You've got to hear it. It helped me so much. Or I ran across this scripture. This has to be our mantra to help us forgive. And it was like because we both leaned into each other instead of pulling away and guarding my heart like what I wanted to do, I gave myself to her. And because of it, I reaped the most, I now have with her, the most healthy, most wonderful, incredible relationship 
We text every day. I babysit her kids. I mean, they're, they are an incredible family. And because of the betrayal and the, and the leaving me, I may have never gotten to this friendship over here. So just because you may lean into this person and you may pour your very life into a person doesn't mean if it is not reciprocated that that's the end, that you made a mistake. Because I know, I know in my five years with this girl, I learned a bunch. She was good to me at times. So I know that it was a little bit reciprocated, but it doesn't stop the process. We have to stay in the process because we, what? We sharpen each other. Kara has sharpened me so much. I would hate to think about how bitter and sad and mean and mad I would be if I had let that thing fester in me for 10 months, what I would be like right now. So don't look at me and think, oh, you know, that's easy for you or whatever. Just think about that example that I know we're all hurt sometimes, but we have to continue in the process, this on-purpose discipleship process, even when it's painful. Even when it's painful. We can't become an island all to ourselves guarding against hurt because then we lose our effectiveness. And what happens when we, when we move over here by ourselves and become this island? We become dull because that's the opposite of sharpened. And who wants to be described as, oh, here comes Sheila. She's dull. <laughs> no, you want people to say, oh, that girl is sharp. You want to hang out with her. She is full of wisdom. She loves to love people. She's faithful. That's how you want people to describe you, not the opposite. But if we opt out of the sharpening process, that's the only thing that can happen to us is we become dull. And I don't want to be dull. I don't want any of us to be dull. There is too much at stake out in the world. This body and whatever church you go to needs you to be sharp because there is way too much at stake. We have to be faithful to the process. We have to be faithful in laying down our lives in service to others, just like Jesus did. We're just mimicking what Jesus did by laying down our life in service to others. We have to be faithful to submitting to our leaders. There are many things we have to be faithful. Being faithful to that process, whether you are the mentor or the mentee, means showing up when you don't want to sometimes. It means people you've given your heart to walking out of your life sometimes. That's what it means. It means showing up when you don't feel like it. It means doing it anyway when you have stuff wrong in your own life. Don't wait till you don't have anything going on in your own life because then the enemy will make sure you don't ever have that time. This is not something that's convenient. I don't know anybody who is sitting around just thinking, oh, I hope a mentor comes into my life because I'm just sitting here doing nothing. <laughs> We're all busy these days. And so you have to, on purpose, go and, and be a part of this process so you can be sharpened. And sometimes when you enter that process, the very answer to your storm is waiting on you there in your community that you were built for. So we have to keep doing it anyway, giving of ourselves, even if we don't believe we have much to give. You may think, I don't really know what my gifts and talents are. You know what? God, you're not an anomaly. God created you as a masterpiece just like he did the next one. And so you have gifts and talents. Maybe they haven't come alive yet because you haven't been in community yet. If you have been opting out and staying over here because you think, I, I, don't, I don't have anything. But you just, I'm, I promise you, just show up to the process and start being faithful and start being faithful and start being faithful because we have to be faithful, 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 faithful to get to the results that we're looking for. 
We have to keep speaking faithful. We have to keep talking faithful. We have to keep walking faithful, walking faithful, walking faithful, walking faithful. We have to keep preaching faithful and preaching faithful and preaching faithful. We have to keep our hand to the plow and keep being faithful. And then you know what happens? You know what happens at that point? You wake up one day and you're living in fruitful. After you have been faithful, 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 fruitful shows up. And when you're living in fruitful, you become loved because you're fruitful. You have tons of friends because you're fruitful. You're sought out for advice because you're so fruitful. You get promoted because you're fruitful. And your whole life becomes about the fruit that you are, are pouring out because you've been faithful. Faithful, or I'm sorry, fruitful, doesn't just show up ready to provide. I can't go sign up at Planet Fitness and get a card and say, I have toned arms. <laughs> I can't do that. I've got to be faithful to Planet Fitness every day. Yeah, I'm in pain. I'm in pain, David. What do I do? <laughs> How do I get toned arms? Be faithful, be faithful, be faithful. And then one of these days, I'm going to have fruit of toned arms. And it's the same in our spiritual life. We have to be faithful. Let me give you some examples of faithful. Ruth got the good-looking man, lots of land and security, because she was faithful to Naomi when there was no hope of a future for her. Esther received the kingdom and notoriety because she was faithful to the Jewish people even when he risked her own life. She was faithful. Nehemiah rebuilt an entire city because he was faithful to them in the face of war and possible death. I don't think any of us are in that situation. And he was still faithful. Paul saw the fruit of many people coming to know Jesus, even through being whipped and shipwrecked and, be, and thrown in jail. He was still faithful. King David was able to kill a giant because he was faithful to the sheep. Before a kingdom was ever in his sights, he was faithful back here with what God had given him. And Elisha inherited a double portion of anointing because he stayed faithful to his leader. A double portion. That's what he inherited. That was the fruit that he had. It's time, ladies. Faithfulness brings fruitfulness. Fruitfulness doesn't just show up ready to provide. Just as much as fruitful needs faithful, faithful provides fruitful. We can't just show up and think we're going to have fruit. We show up for a week. And, and why, why am I not on the pastoral staff yet? <laughs> We've got to be faithful with whatever they've given us. We've got to be faithful to the process, even through the pain, even when you're not seeing the results you want. Because God's word is true, and you will eventually get to the results. But you have to be faithful first. The on-purpose discipleship mentoring process. Because that's how you build your community. That's how the body is so, it will just explode with fruit when we're all united and working together. It's time. It is so time for this. We should be doing this yesterday. We have got to release ourselves as women from these petty jealousies and competitions that kill our fruitfulness. Just because she may be richer than you or skinnier than you or prettier than you or she's married and you're not or she's having kids and you haven't or whatever that thing is that you want that she has, it's time to champion her because she may be the very answer to your problem. Let's champion each other and bring the fruit into our life instead of shooting ourselves in the foot. 
It's time, ladies. It is time that we are known for being warriors instead of these women who are stabbing each other in the back and gossiping about each other. We were built for more than that. We were built for a community that is turning the world upside down, that is turning Oklahoma City upside down. That's what we were built for. That's what God has for us when we're faithful. We have to first be faithful to get to the fruitful. Fruitful gets its legs from faithful. The world we live in is changing, and we can either change with it and become stronger, or we can opt out of the process and become dull. You have an option. You have an option here. I can either stay the way I am and not grow anymore, or I can submit to this process and say, you know what, I'm going to put myself out there. I may get my heart stepped on a few times, but I may not. It may be absolutely beautiful. It may be exactly what I'm looking for. It may be that thing that I've been praying for. I just needed to join with one of my sisters to pray with them every single week, and now we're seeing it come to fruition. That's what's waiting on you with community, with this on-purpose mentoring and discipleship. I wish every church was at this level that saw what could happen in a church, in a city, in a state, in a country when something like this is taking place. It is time. It's time, ladies. I promise you. And the worship team can come back up here. I want to spend a few minutes praying for you guys, if you don't mind. But it's time to sharpen and be sharpened. We will not see fruitfulness until we enter the world of faithfulness. And now today, as I was praying and getting ready for tonight, I was praying for you guys. And I was overwhelmed with someone who was here, or maybe more than one person, I'm not sure. But it was almost like God let me feel the, your pain. And I just sat in my room and cried because I knew you're going to be here tonight. Whoever it is that I'm talking to, I knew you were going to be here tonight. And God was going to speak specifically to you. He wouldn't be this specific with me if he didn't know you weren't going to be here. He knows you're here. And what I feel like he told me was that you, you were hurt and betrayed and you have been walking around as a victim and you have opted out of the process, you've guarded yourself, you've stepped back from people, you don't trust women because of that hurt and betrayal. And what is stopping you is there something you need to apologize for and I don't know what that is. But instead of thinking of yourself as a victim, step outside that for a moment and see what have I not done? What is my sin of omission that I may have was supposed to do, but I haven't done it? I feel like God is telling you it's not too late to fix that because he wouldn't be this specific with me to talk to you about this if he didn't have something for you. Now, I don't know who that is for. I would love for the prayer team to come up, if you don't mind. And you don't have to come up here and confess. I just know that that is a specific word for somebody. You have felt like a victim, but what is really holding you is an apology that you need to make. I know that coming up here and praying with people, it takes courage. And the reason why your heart is beating so hard and you're so scared to come up here is because the enemy knows the power 
behind when we unite our prayers with another person. I would love for you to come up here and pray with one of these ladies or just pray by yourself. You don't have to come up here and pray with them, but I would love for you to come forward and pray. There is never a time that we enter the, the, the house of God that change should not occur and experience with Jesus that changes our life. And so you may be one of those people that, that has been just destroyed. I feel like there's somebody too that has a family issue, like with your sisters or you're with your mom, that you have kept yourself hidden away because of that situation. I don't know what it is, but God wants you to get rid of it. He wants you to lay this down. He wants you to start praying. And if, and if you don't think you have to come up here for anything, then just pray for your sisters. Just start praying right now. And I'll come down and pray as well. But if you, if any of those situations are you, I want you to come forward. Or if you want to start in this discipleship process and you don't know where to start, come up here and just start with prayer. Just join your prayers with somebody and say, hey, you know what? I'm ready. So will you pray for me that God will lead me in the right direction? So I invite you right now to come forward. If any of this has resonated with you, if you're ready to pray and let's worship and pray and I'm gonna come down and pray with anybody who would like to.